Good morning. Other than Rod's comment about my hair, those not bad, not bad prayer. Who needs hair anyway? I mean, come on. What good is it? You know what I'm talking about, Wes. <laughs> oh, all right. And this morning we're going to be talking about love. I love to talk about love. It's fun. My wife and I, we argued over who would be able to give a middle name to our daughter a little bit, uh, our middle daughter. Middle name, middle daughter. She wanted Elise. I wanted love. It, uh, it is... It is Elise, in case anybody's wondering, because I love my wife, and I wouldn't be able to win that argument anyway. But, all right. We are going to start out in 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. You can feel free to turn there if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us real quick while y'all are getting there. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Lord, we love you. God, I pray that you will teach us how to love the way that you want us to love through your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, John. Verse 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. I was told not to have gum in this morning, and I forgot, so I took it out. All right, John writes, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Isn't the end of that so amazing? God is love. We can love because He is love. John 3, 16 through 17 says, For God so loved the world that He did give His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Himself. Isn't that great? God loved the world so much. That's why he sent Jesus, to save us through himself. I love it. I love it. John 15, verse 9. John 15, verse 9. This is Jesus himself speaking. Jesus himself is speaking here. You'll find times where, where people, they want to discard maybe parts of the Bible because somebody else wrote it. Somebody else wrote that portion. But it is all inspired through the Holy Spirit. But this, I love this because this is God himself. Jesus Christ himself is speaking this. It cannot be refuted in any way, shape, or form. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. This is, this is in chapter 15. So think about where this is. Jesus knows that he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's speaking this message to his disciples. He knows what's about to happen. 
It's, it is absolutely imperative that he imparts to them in this moment wisdom, knowledge, understanding that they have to be able to carry out. Think about the last moments, you know, the last, if you, if you know that you're only going to be able to depart or impart one particular thing and you want to drive it home more than anything else, that's where we are right here. Jesus is getting ready to go give his life for us in love. So this is what he is imparting to the disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Remain in my love. And then he says, in verse 10 through 12, he says, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this. This is coming out of Jesus' mouth. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He's laying it out. This is why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you to remain in my love. I'm telling you to love one another because my joy will be in you. And then your joy will be complete when you love one another. Do you want to be joyful? Do you want to have joy in your life? Then love. Do what I do and love other people. If you flip over to Matthew 22, 36 through 40. This is one of the, the most profound parts of the gospel. Jesus is cruising along, right? He's walking around with his disciples and this, this person comes up to him and he calls him teacher. He says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? Tell me, what is the most important out of everything? What is the greatest? What's the most important? And Jesus replies, love. Love. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. In everything that you do, love the Lord your God. Love Him. Put Him before everything else. Don't put anything else before loving Him. He says, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And then he says, and the second one is just like it. You've got the first, this is the second. He thought it so important that this guy asked for the first. What is the most important? Jesus tells him, this is the most important, but I'm also going to tell you the second most important, which is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything else hinges on love. It hinges on it. Everything else, it doesn't matter. If, if you don't have love, whatever else you do doesn't matter. You can be the greatest individual in the whole wide world. You can keep every single other th command that God tells us, but they all Hinge on this. Without this, you might as well not do it. Because this is what everything else is built on. It's the bedrock. It's the foundation. That's where the religious leaders of the time were failing desperately, miserably failing, because they held all these other things. They did it great, but they didn't do it in love. That's where they failed. As I've told you before, John 17 is my all-time favorite chapter in the whole Bible. But 14, 15, 16, 
and 17, they're all just absolutely amazing because it's Jesus just pouring out his heart before he goes to the cross. And he lays this foundation for them. He reminds them of everything that he's done since he's been there. He reminds them of the Father's love for them and his love for them. And he reminds them how they are to act in everything that they do. And this is where it's all at. I'm going to pull several verses out of John 17. I'm not going to read the entire thing. I really wanted to, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. John 17, verse 9. This is where Jesus is praying for his disciples. So Jesus himself is talking to the Father God, praying to the Father God for his disciples. And this is what he says. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, for they are yours. He's laying this out. This is who I'm praying for. I'm praying for those that are yours, those that have chosen you, those that who choose to believe in you, choose to follow you. Those are the ones that you have invested in and given to me, and I, these are the people that I'm praying for you, or for to you. And then Jesus prays for all the believers in verse 20. Guys, this is us. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That's us. Jesus, the son of the most high God, is praying for you and me right here. He says, I pray that all of them may be one. I pray that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in, in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you are or who you are and that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's when the world will know, when we are in unity. I have made you known to them. And the, the Greek, the word more clearly says, I have made your name known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus is, he's breaking it down here and he's praying for us and what he's praying for is that we will love one another and that we will be in unity because that is what will change the world. That's what will change the world. Not all these different factions, not all these different separate churches. That's not what's going to do it. What that shows is that we are extremely split, that we are extremely divided that we can't even stand together as a body of believers and love one another in unity. Why would somebody want to be part of that? No. But Jesus thought that it was so important that he prays it in front of them right before he goes to the cross to let them know, stay together. Be unified. Be one. Just as I am one with the Father. This is what's going to change the world. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, but to lay his life down, to lay down one's life for one's friend, to lay down your life for your friend. What is your life? Is Jesus talking about the very breath that's in your lungs? Is he talking about your physical life? Yes, that is what he's talking about. But laying your life down is so much more than that. It's serving one another. It's loving one another. It's being there for one another, lifting each other up, encouraging one another, putting your own needs, wants, and desires aside whenever somebody else needs you.
There was a quote that, um, that Brittany sent me out of this, this book. Let me see if I wrote down the author. Eric Gilmore. I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of him, but he's got some great stuff, and he's got this book called Honey, and it's just like all these, these little snippets, these passages that, that just really just rock your world, you know, if you're, if you're really um, thinking about it and you're thinking about how it applies to your life and your walk with Christ and where you are with Him. And it says, He died that you might enjoy Him, and through enjoying Him, you would be conformed to His image and by His image accomplish His purposes. Be conformed to His image and that way you will accomplish His purposes. I love it. It's amazing. John 15, 14 says, You are my friends if you do what I command. And keep in mind, this is right after 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. The very next verse says, You are my friends if you do what I command. And he did lay his life down for his friends. He was stating that statement before he went willingly to the cross and laid his life down for his friends. He's telling them, there's no greater love than this. None. There's no greater love. And then he tells them that we are his friends if we lay our lives down for our friend. 15, 15, John 15, 15, the very next verse. Jesus tells us that he no longer calls us servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. He's removing that, that master and slave portion. He's removing that. And he says, because I've made everything that the master, that my Father, wants to tell you. You're obviously not a slave. You are now a friend because I've given you all of this. This is Jesus speaking. It's not anyone else. It's Jesus himself speaking. Then we move over to 1 Corinthians 13. This is called the love chapter, and it's very clear why it's called the love chapter. Love is mentioned time and time again, and I removed just a couple verses um, just to keep it all about love and to, uh, for the sake of time. But if you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 13, this is so extremely powerful. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong, or a clanging symbol. It means no matter what I'm telling you, if I don't do it in love, if I do it for any other reason, it doesn't make a dang bit of difference what's coming out of my mouth. It's just a noise. If I don't do it in love, no matter how true it is, love has to be given in truth, and truth has to be given in love or it does not matter, period. Verse 2 says, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain absolutely nothing. Then he goes on and he says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes, and it always preserves. Perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's the very greatest. John 13, 34. Back to Jesus. This is Jesus speaking again. And he says, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That love that you display for one another will prove to people that you love me, that you listen to me, that you follow me, that you walk after me, that you want to dwell with me, and that I dwell in you. This is how they will know. For me, sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes I don't want to love people. I just don't want to, you know? But I must. I must. I must be crucified with Christ. I must crucify my flesh. That's why we get baptized. The old man dies. You're putting it away. And then you're letting God completely transform your life so that you can live and walk in love that the Holy Spirit can come in you, dwell in you, and the fruits of the Spirit will be displayed in you. The fruits of the Spirit coming through you will not only transform you, but it will also transform everybody around you. Everybody around you. Everyone will be affected. They will either be positively affected or they will be negatively affected. But they get to choose that. They're going to choose one way or another. You know, think about Jesus. Think about how much he loved people and what he did for people and how he set them free, how he healed the sick. He cast out demons from people. You know, demons that were throwing kids in fire and trying to drown kids. He's raising people from the dead raising people from the dead. This is how much he loved them. And he's displaying these things because he loves them so that they will understand that the Father loves them. That's why. That's why he's doing these things. But they still murdered him. But thank God they did so that he could be the sacrificial lamb for us and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, all of our sins. If they wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to. But as he says there, this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He didn't say that they will know that you are my disciples if you go around trying to just correct everybody. If you go around telling everybody, this is what you've done wrong, sinner. That's not what it is. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what they did all throughout their whole, their whole life. You know, They were being raised up and they thought that they were doing the right thing. They did. They thought they were doing the right thing. But they were wrong. And Jesus had to come and straighten that out. 
But on the outside, they looked good. On the outside, it looked like they were doing what was right, but they weren't. And Jesus tells them, this is how people will know, by loving them. Another quote from this Eric Gilmore, he says, If I cling to his presence, then I will always know where he is, and I will always be where I am supposed to be. If I cling to his presence, to his presence, because he loves us and he wants us to cling to his presence. He created us for a relationship to love him, to be in an intimate relationship with him. And if we, if we want that, and we're seeking him out, and we cling to his presence, then we'll always be where he is. And then we will always be where we are supposed to be if we're just seeking after him. Guys, it all starts with love. It all starts with love. God is love. God is love, and he created us to emulate that, to, to put that off, to show other people. There's a, uh, there's a lady that was in our, our prayer and, and healing class this past Tuesday, and I don't know her. I mean, I've, I've seen her a few times. Um, Maybe I've met her. My wife's talked to her a few times, but this this lady, she's a, a waitress, and she goes to work, and when God tells her to, she'll just straight up go and pay for somebody's meal when God tells her to. He didn't tell her, go pay for everybody's meal, but he did say, when I tell you to, go pay for these people's meals. And what's awesome, she's doing everything she can to be obedient. Don't you know that if you don't have all the money in the world, it ain't easy to pay for everybody's meals that God tells you to. It's oftentimes not easy to do what he asks us to do. If it were easy, probably wouldn't be him. He wouldn't get any glory for it. But this girl, like, he told her one day, anybody that sits down alone, go pay for their meal. And there were several people that came in and sat down alone. And she's like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, like, all these people. But have you ever been in a situation where God tells you to do something and you don't feel like that you have the resources to be able to do it? but then you're obedient anyway and you can watch him work. God takes care of us in those times. What he's asking us to do is step out of our comfort zone and what, what that is, what he's doing through us is loving on these people that need to experience the love of God in their life. They need to know that he sees them right where they are. He sees them no matter, no matter what condition that they're in. Who knows that every single person that sat down alone in that restaurant that day was not perfect. They weren't following every single thing that they were supposed to do to be a good Christian. But God met them right where they were, loved on them anyway, to draw them into himself. And she was being a tool, a conduit, a vessel of his to display his love. We're all going to be called to do those things. In all of your areas of influence, he is going to call you to step out and do those things right there. The things that are hard, that are uncomfortable, that you don't feel like you have the resources for, do it anyway because then he will pour back into you and give you what you need when you need it. I've got tons of examples of that in my life. Thinking of the Colossians, Jesus had become part of their lives instead of life itself. He had become part of their lives instead of life itself. 
He had become an addition instead of the all. He had become a door instead of everything. He wants to be our everything. He doesn't just want to be part of it. He wants to be all of it. And when we make Him all of it, He transforms you inside and out. It's not Jesus and I'm going to do this, 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 and this. He wants to be all of it. Jesus is the all. He is the everything. He is love. There's a... a quote from an atheist. His name is Penn Gillette. And I watched this video on this dude, and maybe I've even told you about this guy before because it has impacted my life in an extreme way. An extreme way. An atheist has impacted my life to be, to do more of what God has called me to do. I think God has completely used this guy to Help us to understand what, what it is that we're supposed to do as Christians. Isn't that crazy that God would use somebody that straight up declares there's not a God, that he believes there is not a God. But I found this, the actual quote from this video that I watched, and you guys can jump online and you can watch the video of this guy straight up like he's videoing himself like on his phone because what someone else did made a massive impact in his life he didn't come to the full knowledge of Christ at that point in time. Maybe he has since then because this article is from 2009. The article is, it was written in a uh, column, TGC. I don't know what that stands for. I didn't take the time to look it up. But it was written by Justin Taylor. And what Justin did back in November 18th, 2009, he took a quote from this video, from this absolutely self-professing atheist and he put this down. He titled it, How Much Do You Have to Hate Somebody to Not Proselyze? How much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them that there's a God? To not witness to them and not minister to them? So what the, what the actual quote was, he says, I've always said, and this is an atheist speaking, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, an atheist who think that people shouldn't proselytize and who's and who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He goes on, he says, I mean... If I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that a truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you and this is more important than that. An atheist is saying this that doesn't believe in God. But he's saying, if you do believe in God and you're not willing to tell somebody simply because you think it's going to be uncomfortable or they might not like it, you must hate them. You must hate them because you're okay with them burning in hell for the rest of their lives. You're okay with them being separated from the God that loves you so much that he came and died on this earth for you. That he came and gave everything up so that you can have that relationship. You must hate these people. He's like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is a God. But if you do and you don't tell them, you clearly hate them. That's what he's saying. And I have to agree. I have to agree. That's why whenever he comes back and he meets with them on the mountain and he says, I've been given all power and authority. It's all been given to me and now I give it to you. Now go and make disciples. 
go into all nations and make disciples. What does that mean? It means tell people about the fact that I love them so much that I want to be in a relationship with them. Tell them that I love them so much that this is what I did for them. He also says they hated me and they killed me. And they're going to hate you and they're probably going to kill you. And the people that he was talking to, all of them but one got martyred. All of them got killed. Isn't that crazy? At least his disciples. They all got killed. The first one got hung upside down on a cross because he didn't want to be killed the same way that his master was because he said that he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve to die the same way that Christ died. So he let him hang him upside down on a cross. He didn't say, go and make all these disciples. It's going to be smooth sailing. No, he said, go. They're going to hate you. They're going to kill you. But go, because I've overcome the world. I want to encourage you guys to don't just talk about it, be about it. Don't just talk about it, especially in here. It's good to talk about it in here. This is where we come and we get built up and we love on each other and we strengthen each other so we can go out and so we can do what he's called us to do out there. Don't just come here being a Christian just here. Don't do it. Don't do it. And if you want to, this probably isn't the place for you. If you think about it, even in our sins, Christ died for us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why I say that? Because I don't want you to go out and make Christians out of more Christians. You've got to find people that need God, that need Him. And don't wait till you're perfect to do it. Don't wait till you're perfect. The fact is, God has made you perfect already. The devil's going to tell you that you're not. He's going to tell you that the way that you act and the way that you live is, is not right. Therefore, you shouldn't be the one going out and talking to people. You shouldn't be the one sharing the Word of God. You shouldn't be the one loving on people like Jesus tells us to because look at you. Who are you? Who are you? The fact is, you are the righteousness of Christ. You have God living in you. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. He dwells inside you. He has made you righteous, not by what you've done, but by who He is. He has made you righteous. You are perfect in His eyes. Accept His love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Thank you, God, that you have washed our sins away. that our most righteous deeds, the best things we could ever do, are as filthy rags, but that we are covered in the blood of Jesus. And that you love us. Help us to honor you. Help us to respect you. Help us to love you to the very best that we possibly can, Lord. And help us to love others as you are our example. God, I pray that you will give us an extra measure of your grace, an extra measure of your, your faith, Lord. I pray that you will help us to accept the fact that you live in us and that you live through us, Lord. Help us to be your hands and feet here on this earth. 
Thank you for your love, Lord. Help us to give your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen.